What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into another live stream here on the CRW channel. April 5th edition here, Spring Stream 2, continuing to discuss WVU football. We'll have one of these per week throughout the spring football season. Going to discuss, you know, all the happenings going on with WVU football, who's standing out and whatnot, whatever news topics come up along the way. I got a couple pulled all pull up and you know we can chat about but for the most part I want to let you guys guide the conversation kind of a little q a here so as always encourage you guys here throughout this uh spring stream to go ahead and drop your questions comments concerns in the chat there i'll address those throughout here as we touch on some uh, news topics along the way like i said it'll be heavy uh wvu football centric but do have some wvu basketball topics i wanted to touch on here we'll get those out of the way at the start and then we'll uh transition into some football topics but i appreciate everyone that's hopped in here live see you guys in here timmy kenny all you guys catch up on some of your comments uh momentarily let me get to this uh basketball news and we'll get it out of the way and then uh switch our gears and get into some football stuff but i'll uh, catch up on your all's comments here momentarily and encourage anyone else questions comments concerns drop them in the chat and we'll hit on those All right, so some of the basketball news. Um, I think some of it was kind of more expected, and then some of it maybe not as expected. But uh, first of all, we saw you know Carmelo Adkins request his NLI release from West Virginia. He was the only you know high school commit that West Virginia had coming in for this 2024 class. But you knew this kind of was maybe going to be in the cards happening just because he was recruited by the previous staff, Josh Eiler and company. So you didn't know when the new staff came in if they would want to, you know, keep that commitment to him or if he would want to keep his commitment to West Virginia, you know, whichever was the case there or could have been, you know, both parties kind of wanting to go their separate ways. Either way, uh, Carmelo Atkins was granted his release, not no, any, no longer in the class of 2024, if I can get that out right, um, for the WVU basketball team. So, you know, in the previous live stream, I talked about K.J. Tenner, who was previously a Drake commit. He had been uh, granted his release there from his commitment to Drake, and I wondered if West Virginia could potentially target him. And we knew it might be something that they would be wanting to do, and it turns out that was indeed the case. West Virginia does go after KJ Tenner. Coach DeVries had, you know, previously had him committed at Drake. He gets his release from that commitment and comes to WVU, where he will follow Coach DeVries, becoming the first high school commit to. Um, you know, play for or, or recruit to commit to play for Darren DeVries anyways. Uh, K.J. Tenner announced this yesterday. You may have seen it on social media there. Probably seen him post it. He is at Emerson Tenner 3 if you want to follow him there on Twitter, Mountaineer Nation. You see the graphic there, 110% committed to West Virginia University. Thanks, Coach DeVries, for believing in me. Um, Tucker DeVries really excited about this one as well. You've seen him sharing the tweet. Let's go, bright future ahead. And I think definitely this is a big freshman for West Virginia to get. And, of course, no shade throw to Carmelo Adkins or anything, but I think K.J. Tanner is a nice pickup. You know, I talked about it when he was released from his um, NLI there um, at Drake that he was, you know, Mr. Basketball in the state of Tennessee, one of the top players in that state, and uh, going to be a good guard for West Virginia to have here as they're continuing to try and build this roster and fill out these remaining spots here to start the Darren DeVries era, you see some of the numbers there. Uh, you see the list of offers. Average 23 points as a senior. Um, you know, so, you know, Tennessee, no slouch when it comes to basketball. So, very talented player. Good pickup here for West Virginia to add K.J. Tanner to the roster for the upcoming season. And then, additionally, I did see this just before I went on. I actually had not seen this prior to. So, shout out to WVSportsNow.com for providing this. But, additionally, basketball news. Um as far as high school recruits are concerned, I don't know if West Virginia would go after another one because, you know, like I said, they only had one high school commit previously. Would they add another one and have two high school commits now for this upcoming class? You never know, but you got to report on the possibility, just like we did with KJ Tenner when he was, you know, granted his release, um, in a live release for Andrew L. Burton Jr. as well. He was a Drake commit, also a three star signee. He's probably going to get released and be, you know, free to go wherever he pleases. Could he potentially come to West Virginia as well? I don't know, but it's definitely something that I wanted to address with the same thing that happened with KJ Tenner happening with him as well. He could want to follow Coach DeVries also. You see there him making his statement um, uh, on social media and so opening up his recruitment, and who knows if he will end up at WVU too. Um, it's hard to say, but uh, we do know that West Virginia has KJ Tenner now on board. 
as a freshman. And then we know that they're targeting a lot of transfers in the portal as well. Uh, we've talked about a ton of those. I think I've covered them a bunch. You know, I did a basketball only stream a couple of days ago, kind of impromptu just because of the basketball news that came out. Uh, so the only other transfer that I think West Virginia has contacted since then that I wanted to add to the list here is JV and McCollum, an Oklahoma transfer. West Virginia contacted him. This was reported on earlier today from Ethan Bach over on WVSportsNow.com. So, you know, he's a highly sought after transfer. He's heard from Florida, Georgia, Georgia Tech, Kentucky, Michigan, Texas A&M, USC, Vanderbilt, and VCU in addition to WVU. That's just since he entered the portal, you know, just a couple of days ago. So, Highly sought after, but WVU trying to get in the mix there for another guard. Average 13 points, three rebounds, and three assists in 30 games with Oklahoma. 40% from the field, 31% from the three-point free line, and 94% from the free throw line. Uh, pretty impressive numbers there. So, uh, West Virginia, you know, going hard after some transfers. We've talked about all the ones they've been in contact with, and all of them seem to be very talented, and McCollum certainly falls in line with those as well. So, wanted to update that as far as the basketball news before we can transition into some football topics here. Uh, but before we do, let me catch up on some uh, comments here. Appreciate you, Timmy. See you in here. Uh, hello, Jordan. Always enjoy your so shows, outstanding content. Thank for all the work you do for fans like me. Let's go, Mountaineers. Hey, Tim, appreciate that, man. That's uh, real nice of you. Always appreciate you being in here, and you're a great West Virginia fan. Always appreciate you and your uh, kind words, man. Uh, let's go, Mountaineers, indeed. See you as well, to, uh, Kenny. And uh, Kenny says, uh, here's West Virginia land, the number one player out of WV again. Yes, they did. Uh, perfect transition. I wanted to talk about this. I, of course, dropped the uh, video on it earlier on the channel. You know, you can check that out for more in-depth thoughts on the uh, commitment of uh, Z Zah Jackson, I believe it is. I'll pull up the list here to get it right. I think that's right. Yeah, Zah Jackson and Thomas Barr were the two. Uh, Zah Jackson is the number one player in the state of West Virginia. And West Virginia already had a commitment from Tyshawn Dews, who is also one of the top players in the state. So yet again, Neil Brown and company, like they've done pretty much every year since he's been here, you know, locking down the top players in the state. They've landed either, you know, the number one or number two player in the state. Sometimes both of those, sometimes all of the top three, you know, two out of the three. But every year they've got at least one of the top players in the state of West Virginia to commit and stay home at WVU since Neil Brown came, and uh, that's holding true yet again, Tyshawn Dews and now Zah Jackson. But let me pull up the 2025 commitment list, uh, Kenny. Thank you. Appreciate that great segue, actually, um, But because I did want to address that. But like I said, I've got videos out. Um, these are the two commits West Virginia got um, just yesterday, actually, both coming in the same day. West Virginia received the verbal commitment from uh, offensive lineman out of Pennsylvania there in Haverford, the Haverford School in Thomas Barr, 6'3", 290. Great size, um, underrated as a recruit right now because he missed last season because of some injuries, but I think his ratings will shoot up once he goes through this senior year. And, of course, Zah Jackson, as we mentioned, currently the highest-rated recruit in WV, uh, going to play cornerback, and he's uh, out of Huntington, 5'10", 180. Good prospect there. And they joined Tyshawn Dews and Scotty Fox. So four commitments for West Virginia in the 2025 class. Like I said, I put out a video on these two uh, today if you want to check that out on the channel. Uh, be sure to do that if you haven't already. But just before we went live, um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to see this yet or not. Um, you may have seen it on social media. Uh, Jaheim White actually is one that shared this. Uh, so you may have seen this and wondered, uh, what, he, what was he talking about exactly? You see Jaheim White underscore 305. That's uh, Jaheim there on X slash Twitter. Uh, but he says, let's go. And uh, tags to be football, you know, tags Matthew Parker. Um, who's Matthew Parker, you ask? He's a 2025 recruit as well, and he is a kicker slash punter from the same high school as Jaheim, so former high school teammate. So Jaheim White certainly excited that he's chosen to commit to WVU as well. Let me pull up his uh, commitment graphic that he shared on social media and talk a little bit about him. Um, Matthew Parker committing to WVU as well today. Um, he's actually going to be a preferred walk-on, though, so not a scholarship player, so not going to add him to the commitment tracker necessarily, but he is a preferred walk-on. You know, a lot of these specialists do initially come in as preferred walk-ons, earn scholarships down the line, things like that, but he's, you know, a kicker slash punter, could have played either one. He did a little bit of both of those in high school, but I believe here at WVU he's, you know, kind of going to be just 
coming to be a kicker and a kickoff specialist uh, is kind of what WV is pegging him for. Like I said, coming as a preferred walk-on initially, but they're kind of leaving the door open to potentially earn that scholarship down the road. He was, you know, highly sought after not only by WV but other Power 5 programs. Uh, Penn State, Duke, and Pitt were also in on him trying to get him. So West Virginia getting that commitment pretty good. And, of course, uh, you're excited when it's one of your best players on your team. Jaheim White is someone that he's excited about. That's good for uh, culture and chemistry and things like that as well. And hopefully he's just as talented as uh, Jaheim is as a running back. He's that talented as a specialist and uh, can be a great kickoff guy in the future. But 2025 class added a preferred walk-on commit as well today to join, you know, Zah Jackson and Thomas Barr, who committed a scholarship players yesterday you get Matthew Parker a specialist coming from uh, York High School there in York Pennsylvania uh, joining today as a preferred walk-on so wanted to touch on that as well and uh, Kenny you provided the perfect segue for me to talk about uh, those commits there for sure so as Kenny says woohoo dang good recruiting for sure absolutely continuing a good trend and uh, I think a lot of it is not only you know showing up as far as highly rated guys, star rating and such, but they're really good fits for what West Virginia is doing scheme-wise and things like that. I think you look at just the past couple of seasons and you can look at, uh, you know, the running back position alone, both last recruiting class and the one prior to that, you know, neither C.J. Donaldson or Jaheim White was super highly rated, but West Virginia did a great job of finding them kind of, you know, diamonds in the rough, if you want to call it that, but they found someone that they knew was a fit for them. And both those guys were superstars from the moment that they were freshmen. So I think this staff's doing a good job, not only, you know, rankings wise, but I think you got to look kind of beyond the numbers, beyond the star ratings with some of this to see, you know, how good of a job that they're doing. But when it comes to in-state recruiting, no matter how you spin it, they're knocking that completely out of the park, hitting nothing but home runs and grand slams and have been, you know, since day one coming in here the first year, you know, they've had their full recruiting class ever since then. They've been doing a great job in-state recruiting and, of course, borderline states as well. You look in this 2025 class upcoming, two WV commits and then two commits from borderline states, one from Ohio and one from Pennsylvania. So I agree, Kenny, doing an awesome job recruiting for sure. Um, Kenny Evans, appreciate you uh, tuning in and chiming in as well. Um, I know you heard the voice crack right there. I think my throat's a little dry, right? <laughs> Take a swig of my water real quick. Uh, I'll read your comment then, Kenny, and uh, respond to you. Well, you read my mind, Kenny, pretty much. I see you talking about in-state recruiting. He says, great shows, bud. Brown has done good with in-state players. Holgerson said couldn't recruit in-state, um, saying that Holgerson can be like Pitt and eat shit. <laughs> hey, I couldn't agree uh, more with that one when it comes to his efforts on in-state recruiting or, I guess, lack thereof. He never really tried. You know, I think Darnell Wright, you know, now in the NFL, said it best himself when talking about, you know, not being able to land, you know, players in West Virginia that would win. Darnell Wright, you know, responded on Twitter, you know, back when that all happened, saying you got to at least try because, you know, he was saying they didn't even try to recruit me. You know, Doug Nestor expressed the same. So certainly they weren't too gung-ho on in-state recruiting. And you're seeing the difference that it makes when someone, you know, you got a coach here that is gung-ho on it and not only gung-ho on that, but just, you know, kind of doing that 300-mile radius thing that Don Nealon did when he got here, you know, stuck a pin in Morgantown and then, you know, did a 300 circle radius around it and said, these are the areas we can get good players. And this staff's doing a good job of that, but they're also, you know, taking a chance and dipping into, you know, Florida, Georgia for some good speed and some good players from there as well to go in, you know, along with their home base, if you want to call it that. That's what I like to call it, the way that they're recruiting, you know, West Virginia and the borderline states for sure. And I uh, couldn't be happier about it, definitely. I appreciate you guys, though, tuning in and chiming in. And I appreciate anyone else that's in here uh, live. And if you are in here live, you know, do me a favor. It really helps a ton just hitting that thumbs up button, giving us a like. Helps a ton with the YouTube algorithm. That helps whether you're watching this live or if you're watching this after the fact on a playback. Uh, helps us out a lot. And uh, if you are in here live, you know, continue to drop your thoughts there in the chat. I'll touch on your all's comments. If you're watching on a playback, you know, you can drop them in text form. I'll try and respond there. And, of course, I'll probably upload this to the uh, podcast platforms also. So appreciate you tuning in. Um, to the playback as well on the audio side. If you listen to this, you know, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, you know, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, wherever you tune in, uh, we appreciate you doing that as well. But uh, for everyone in here live, continue to drop your thoughts in there and we'll uh, touch on those as well as some uh, news topics I got here. But uh, 
Let's move on to the next news topic real quick, and then I'll catch up on some more of your all's comments because we do have a couple of uh, number changes that I wanted to discuss, uh, one of which is uh, Sean Martin. And this one, um, kind of emotional for sure, uh, sentimental, whatever you want to call it. Um, Sean Martin from Bluefield High School, actually same high school I graduated from. You know, I graduated there long before he did, of course. I'm a good bit older than he is, but um, – there is a young man from Bluefield. Uh, his name was uh, Tony Webster. He passed away, you know, a few years ago. Um, he was a football player. I believe he played with Sean, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he was while he was lifting weights. And it was, you know, extremely sad. The community in here was in Mercer County really, you know, kind of was torn up and heartbroken and rightfully so. You know, I didn't really know little Tony that much, but I, you know, I did see his dad a lot when I was at Bluefield because he was heavily involved uh, with the basketball team. He ran kind of all the practices. He was the main assistant coach, one of the lead uh, coaches there. So he was always around and stuff. And so you would see, you know, the, the his sons there, little Tony being one of those when I was in school running around and everything. So a lot of people in the community knew him, you know, from that, of course, and then from him being an athlete himself. So certainly it was something that was emotional and affected a lot of people and, Uh, They kind of rallied around, you know, the number five, uh, which was his number, uh, which is kind of fitting also at WVU because we know that's, you know, a great number. Obviously, Pat White synonymous with that number. But we're going to see Sean Martin wearing that number this year uh, to represent his late high school teammate, which is uh, pretty awesome of him to do. He announced that uh, this week. Uh, Like I said, the hashtag five forever was going around a lot here, you know, Bluefield area and, of course, throughout Mercer County. And I think it's pretty awesome, uh, Sean, honoring uh, Tony Webster, as you see him seeing him there in the quotes uh, uh, talking about um, honoring him to, with the switch to uh, number five. So that will be the switch for Sean Martin. And uh, he's not the only one switching uh, numbers. We also will have another number switch on the defensive side. I'm sure there will be more that will come out. And I'll try and – once we get closer to the season, I will probably do uh, – the past couple of years I've done it as well. Like kind of towards the end of fall camp, I usually do a jersey number revealed video where I just kind of go through the roster – Usually in numerical order, i uh, let you know what jersey number everyone's wearing and then, you know, any other changes. I'll kind of break that down there then. But in addition to Sean Martin switching from 91 to 5, we have Trey Lathan switching from 19 to 4. He's going to be wearing number 4 this year. I'm sure you saw in the thumbnail both uh, Sean Martin and Trey Lathan represented with their new jersey numbers they'll be wearing this year. And that's, of course, credit to uh, WVU Uniforms 304 on uh, Twitter. Uh, check them out if you haven't ever uh, – you know, they do some great stuff throughout the season. We share a lot of their work. You know, they do a good job sharing not only the uniform combo for the upcoming game, but the, they share, you know, a graphic of each one they've worn throughout the season, plus kind of records and uniforms. So at WV Uniforms 304, uh, they did the uh, edit there for Trey Lathan to uh, his number four and this one here of Sean Martin uh, into the number five that you see on the thumbnail as well. So that's the two jersey number switches. want to talk about Sean Martin, 91 to five. Um, shout out to uh, Bluefield High School and uh, Little Tony, hashtag five forever. And then Trey Lathan switching from 19 to four. So wanted to uh, talk a little bit about those number changes as well. That was kind of one piece of news that came out uh, this past week. Um, catch up on some of your all's comments here and then uh, get through some more uh, football news topics. We switch gears and talk more about uh, West Virginia football now through uh, week two of spring practice. Tim Green, appreciate you, Tim. He says, can't wait to see what kind of team and staff we end up with this fall for West Virginia basketball season. I have faith in the coach, and I think we're going to be fine. Yeah, as do I, man. I really, you know, Darren DeVries, when it came down to kind of the candidates that were interviewed and stuff, he was certainly my favorite there. And I think that, you know, thus far, you know, he's brought in Tucker, which was huge. You're talking about a guy that was widely regarded as probably the number one player in the nation in the transfer portal that West Virginia is going to have to build around. Like I said, K.J. Tenner talked about him earlier in their stream. think that's a good high school player to get, and I'm excited to see what other transfers they land. But I think West Virginia has the potential in basketball to maybe get back to the tournament, Tim. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, and then uh, Kenny says, uh, on paper, this is the scariest WVU defense has ever, ever had. Um, and certainly, you know, Kenny – I don't know if I'm going to go that far. You know, I don't want to get into hyperbole necessarily, but I do think that 
this WVU defense is really going to surprise some people. Uh, they've got a lot of depth, particularly, you know, at the linebacker position that they haven't had with this staff. And, you know, they've found ways to be successful on defense despite, you know, not having uh, depth last season. Um, you know, they played essentially Malachi Ruffin and Beanie Bishop at cornerback pretty much all game, every game, right, especially after the first, you know, three or four games of the season. And then they had depth issues at linebacker as well. This year they have, you know, experience depth, talented depth at, you know, both those levels, the linebacker and the secondary. I'm super excited for, you know, some of these guys to really break out. Some some guys we know, like, you know, we just talked about Trey Lathan. You know, he was well on his way to probably being a freshman All-American last year before his injury. I think he's going to really just pick up right where he left off. And then you got a guy like – um. Josiah Trotter, who we haven't even had a chance to see yet. Obviously, he has the pedigree. His dad, you know, was an NFL superstar. I think he's really going to have a big year. And then, of course, Ben Cutter is going to be in his second year. Reed Carrico coming in, the linebacker position. And, you know, that's just, you know, the bikes and wheels. You're not even getting into the Spurs, which, you know, we got a lot of guys that are standing out there. But then the secondary is where I'm really excited because I think we have, you know, five at least what I would consider – good probably cornerbacks that are competing for those, you know, two spots, you know, and really you're going to have four of those and then kind of another guy that you're probably going to rotate around. Same with, you know, safety, both free cat and the spear. I think we got a lot of bodies to use there. So this defense will surprise the people for sure, Kenny. I'm not willing to go as far as, you know, scariest they've ever had. I got to see it in action first, but I think there is a lot more potential here on the defensive side than people realize. And, you know, if the defense can improve and be as good as, you know, we're kind of hyping it up to be here, then, man, this team could really be special. And I think that the potential is there for it to be a special season this football season. Um, Kenny Evans says, if our two running backs go down, how does the depth chart look? Great question, Kenny. And uh, that's, you know, something that we can talk about here because in the spring we're kind of going to get a look at some of that. Um, not necessarily because anyone's injured and out for long term, but um, – Speaking of that, I did want to touch on that really quickly, though. You know, I provided the other injury updates, you know, in the last stream, and those kind of remain the same, the players that are out, the players that are limited. But also we heard that um, T.J. Crandall, the transfer cornerback from Colorado State, he's kind of banged up, not not practicing right now. I guess he's limited. And then the uh, kicker, Michael Hayes, has been out. So uh, walk on R.J. Uh, Koken, I believe is the name. I know the first name is R.J. I might be mistaken on the last name. I think that's what it is, though. Has been handling the uh, placekeeping duties. But speaking of running back specifically, Kenny, um, C.J. Donaldson is limited, so we're not really going to see him this spring, I don't think. You know, you might see him get, get a few snaps in the gold-blue game, but they're pretty much, you know, kind of letting him heal up throughout the spring. You're not seeing a ton of him. I think, you know, Jaheim White kind of will be similar. He's going to play They're you know, Using him, obviously, letting him go through this spring, it's going to be, you know, a big learning time for him. So he's playing a ton. But I think, you know, they're not going to let him take a ton of hits in the spring game or anything. So it's a big, you know, spring for Jalen Anderson, our third running back who has stuck around. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, maybe he's going to leave like Justin Johnson. But, no, he stuck it out. And he's really going to be getting a lot of reps here through the spring. And it could be a big spring for him because he's a guy that they could count on some, you know, in the fall. And he's a guy that has a lot of potential. You look at that Oklahoma State game, you know, two seasons ago when he really went off and you saw some of that potential flashes of it. So it's there for him. And I think, you know, this is a big spring for Jalen Anderson. But then we're also going to get a look at a couple of guys who may be, you know, guys for the future. Preferred walk-on guys, um, Clay Ash being one that's uh, sticking out, I think, so far through the spring. Um, just got here not too long ago. Like I said, he's not a scholarship guy, but who knows? He could be a guy that earns a scholarship down the road. You're going to see him get some carries here uh, throughout the spring. So I think that, you know, that's when we're talking spring-wise. We get into the fall, and it's a whole different ball game when we got uh, Dior Hubbard and uh, – the other running back who I can't think of uh, his name has slipped my mind right now as well. Got a couple more of those young guys coming in that are going to be really good freshmen. And we, like I talked about earlier, West Virginia has done a good job hitting on, you know, kind of uh, hidden gym running backs the past two years. You know, CJ two years ago, Jaheim last year. So don't be surprised if, you know, D. Or Hubbard um, is, you know, one of those guys, you know, again, this season or the other running back that we got late. I've got it. It's bugging me now. I got to think of the name. I can't. Uh, it's slipping my mind, the other running back uh, commit that we have that will be here in the summer. Like I said, these are guys that are not on campus yet. These, both these running backs won't be here till the summer. But it's uh, Trayvon Dunbar. Trayvon Dunbar is the other one. I think that both Dunbar and Dewar Hubbard are, are good running backs. So, you know, if 
you know, knock on wood, hopefully nothing happens to CJ or Jaheim both, you know, because hopefully we're going to have at least one of those guys healthy. But I'm super excited to see both those guys play together a little bit this season because if you look last year, that's one of the things that we didn't get a ton of was getting both those guys on the field together. You know, you look at the beginning part of the season when CJ was kind of playing uh, before he kind of was nicked up there towards the end of the year. Um, Jaheim really hadn't came into his own. Jaheim didn't start playing until right, you know, what, last six, seven games of the season extensively. And by that time, CJ was kind of not really playing his full role. So we really haven't yet to see both those guys out there fully healthy together on the field. And especially when you got a chance, like we do this all, all season, to really throw out some interesting stuff game plan wise of how you can use both those guys on the field together. So I think that's going to be fun. But, you know, if something was to happen, I got a lot of faith in Jalen Anderson if he does stick around. And I'm thinking that he's going to have a good spring and he will stick around and play a part for us this fall. But also those freshmen that we have coming in um, in the summer are going to play part in the future of the running back room for sure. <clears throat> Tim Green says, we also have a lot of depth on both sides of the ball for linemen. For sure. That's one thing that I think that this staff has done an excellent job of. And, you know, that's, I think, how you build a program, right? you got to build it from the trenches out, from the inside out. you got to start there. And if you look at this West Virginia team, you know, last season, you know, one of the most successful we've had since joining the Big 12, what were our best units, our offensive line and our defensive line. I think that's probably going to ring true yet again this season, and that's because we have a ton of depth on uh, both of those units. So definitely agree with you there, Tim. But take a swig of my water again, and then I will catch up on some new stories. You guys continue to drop your questions, comments, concerns in the chat. Touch on some of those throughout as well. All right, so uh, – Thought this was fitting since we were just talking about Trey Lathan's number change. He actually was named, you know, game changer of the day. Uh, back was this April 4th? Yes, this was from April, the April 4th practice. Of course, the players are in pads now. We reported that last time. You know, last Friday was kind of the first day in pads. Um, Aiden Garns was a big standout that day. I mentioned him. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about a little bit now was those defensive backs. Um, you know, Garnett Hollis is one that's really stood out since he got here. The transfer from Northwestern, um, really great size, you know, 6'2", over 200 pounds, NFL defensive back body. He has that kind of potential that Beanie Bishop had, but even, you know, greater prototypical size, I guess you could say. And so I think he's really got a chance to show out. He'll be wearing number one this season. And then Aiden Garns, who's wearing number 20 right now throughout the spring. He's a transfer from Duquesne. And he's really starting to stand out, I think, as well and really, you know, surprise some people uh, and to the point that Neil Brown mentioned both those guys in his press conference that he had yesterday. And I wanted to kind of share his comments. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to pull up Neil Brown's uh, comments on his thoughts on both uh, Garnet Hollis and Aiden Garns because what he said about Aiden Garns uh, really popped to me. And then I've got a couple of highlights, actually, of those guys uh, from the spring that WV Football shared on their Instagram um, earlier this week or maybe in last week. It came here a few days ago. But nonetheless, let's hear uh, Neil Brown's comments first uh, in regards to Garnet Hollis and um, Aiden Garns. Um, you know, Garnett, I think, is a, is a guy that, you know, I think he's going to be an NFL player. And um, Joseph is around the ball a lot, and they're both real students of the game. They're in this building a lot. And, and I think that's something that's – that is, you know, it manifests itself, right? People that, that really love football and want to get better, you know, they find themselves in this building a lot. And it, you can tell those guys are. Um, Aiden Garns is going to – he's going to surprise people. You know, he really jumped out to us when we played him last year, and he can run. He he can run stride for stride with with EJ, who's who's as fast as anybody we're gonna play. Um, and he's always around the ball. He he's uh, he's had multiple picks. He had two for a touchdown on Friday. Um, I like the way he plays. He's really smart. He can play a bunch of different positions. So there you go. And uh, that really got me excited about Aiden Garns. You know, the transfer from Duquesne, I think that he's got a chance to really make some plays. You know, Garnett Hollis, I think that he's got a chance to be, you know, the number one corner. I think that that's kind of the given. But I think Aiden Garns is the one that's really surprising 
because I think it was really kind of looked at like, you know, Montre Miller, Jacoby Spells, you know, Garnett Hollis, and um, T.J. Crandall because T.J. Crandall's offer list was so impressive. Now, I did mention T.J. Crandall's kind of bang, banged up a little bit right now, so maybe that's why he's not getting in the mix as much. But Aiden Garns is certainly, you know, making the most out of his opportunities there, you know, as Neil Brown mentioned. And what really got me excited was him talking about the speed, you know, him not only being – a cornerback with good instincts, but also has great speed. He's keeping up with EJ Horton, who's arguably the fastest player on our team. So that's great to have a cornerback that's talented, young, and has that type of speed. So I'm glad to hear Aiden Garns is really making plays here throughout the spring. So keeping out an eye on him. And just to kind of coincide with that, I wanted to share this from the WVU Football Instagram. Um, let me see here if I can uh, pull it up. There we are. I'll go full screen with it for you guys. Uh, but you see, they shared best on best. And uh, in the picture here, you see uh, the wide receivers trailing Ray and the cornerback there is Aiden Garns, who uh, Neil Brown was talking about. And then they have a little bit of video footage here. I'm going to scroll over and it'll start uh, here, but a little bit of video footage as well. It's Aiden Garns with the pass breakup. And that is uh, Jaheim Joseph, the Northwestern transfer safety with another pass break up there on the deep ball. He's been playing the deep safety for the Mountaineers. It looked like Raleigh Collins there with uh, some good coverage there. Going to be playing the Spears on this season. And there's Garnett Hollis on Jaden Bray. Jaden Bray, a wide receiver from Oklahoma State they've been impressed with. But you see great coverage there by Garnett Hollis and just good size. And here's uh, Traylon Ray on Aiden Garns there with that pass break up at the beginning. Let's see if they got another one here. Yeah, more to Garnett Hollis on EJ Horton. See great coverage there by Garnett Hollis all over him. Good catch, though, hanging on to the ball by EJ. And I like this here to end it up. Just a smooth route there by Huddy. I think Hudson Clement is uh, going to really uh, pop off this season. Could be a breakout year for him. And then you see Preston uh, catching the deep touchdown there. And then another deep ball there. E.J. Horton burning the defense. Hopefully we see uh, some of those long balls this year. Uh, but definitely wanted to show some of those uh, spring highlights there. You get a good look at, you know, some of the receivers that we know, obviously, Huddy, you know, E.J. Horton, um, Preston Fox making plays. But then I really wanted to highlight some of those defensive backs, especially since they were, you know, so highly talked about by Neil Brown and company this week. Um, Aiden Garns and Garnett Hollis. You can see them a little bit in action there. You see the size on Garnett Hollis there, number one. And then Aiden Garns looking great in coverage. Like I said, keeping up with EJ Horton step for step. Has good speed. So I uh, wanted to uh, showcase some of that. Uh, other than that, I think I just wanted to uh, – I think that's pretty much all I've got as far as uh, news topics are concerned, guys. So just catch up on some of your all's comments, uh, chat with you all a little bit, and then get up out of here before too much longer. But – I appreciate you guys here tuning in for a spring stream too. Like I said, uh, we'll continue to have these once a week, have another one next week. And I think uh, Neil said at the press conference yesterday, they're going to get in the stadium tomorrow, not necessarily a scrimmage, but they are going to do some 11 on 11. So maybe we'll get some uh, good news out of that. Um, and then of course, hopefully next week, some more juicy things start to come out. You know, they're going to start scrimmaging and stuff. So more and more details are going to come out and we'll have more and more to talk about here on subsequent, uh, spring streams, of course, culminating with the, uh, gold blue game recap. We'll have their live streaming following the conclusion of the gold blue game on April 27th, which hopefully you guys are heading up there to Morgantown to check that out. Hopefully we're going to get a uniform reveal there at the spring game. That's one thing I'm excited about, but I'm going to catch up on some of your all's comments here. And then I guess we'll, uh, Get up out of here and close up shop here in this uh, live stream before too much longer. Kenny Evans says, how does quarterback depth look? Well, I think, if, obviously, you know, the known commodities, of course, Garrett's going to be your starter. Nico's going to be your backup. And I think Nico is probably now to the point where they're expecting him and we're expecting him as fans as well to kind of make that next jump to where he's not only serviceable, but he's a guy that can go, you know, win you games if need be. You know, I know he won the – you know, game against Pittsburgh last year, but also, you know, it wasn't, you know, a performance necessarily I think he'd write home about. And um, we all know there were some improvements there needed to be made. But by all accounts, he's looking good here throughout the spring. The first day of spring practice, he actually, you know, was at the helm by himself uh, as the starter. Garrett wasn't there. His grandfather had passed away. 
And so he missed, you know, the first day of spring practice. So Nico did have a day with the starters as well. But, you know, it seems like he's taking a good step. So obviously those guys are going to be really good. I think Garrett's going to be absolutely phenomenal. You know, quarterbacks, you know, at WVU are so much better in their second year as a starter. And uh, Garrett Green really put up some phenomenal numbers last year. Some people really don't realize how good of a season that he had. So he could really be something special this year and a lot of talent on offense for West Virginia. But beyond that, you know, you're looking at a guy like, um, I can't think of the name now. It's uh, slipping me, guys. Sean Boyle. I wanted. I don't know why I was going to say Scott, but Sean Boyle, you know, freshman last year, he's in his redshirt freshman season. You know, just like Garrett and Nico, he's a guy that can, you know, run the football as well as throw it. He's got good speed for a quarterback dual threat. And so those are pretty much, you know, your three scholarship guys that you're looking at for this season. And then other than that, you got some preferred walk-ons that will be filling out the roster. So it's certainly something that you're looking at, you know, continuing to build but that's what you got for the spring. Now, for the fall, obviously, you're going to have Khalil Wilkins coming in, who's another dual-threat guy, you know, a good recruit in this class. This staff was really high on six foot four, 190-plus pound guy out of the state of Maryland. Uh, got good potential for the future. You know, I think you're in good hands. You got Garrett here for his final season, and, you know, you're going to be at the point where you're not really going to have to you know, bring in somebody, and you're all finally off that hamster wheel that you were on so long for so long of, you know, transfer quarterbacks. You had Garrett, you know, as a high school starter for the first time last year, you know, high school recruit starting at quarterback. And now I think you're to the point where hopefully you can keep that going, right? Garrett, after he moves on, it's going to finally be Nico's turn. He waited his turn. Next season, he'll likely be the starter. And then hopefully, you know, you'll get him, you know, for a couple of years. And, you know, you got to hope and believe that Khalil Wilkins and Sean Boyle have seen, you know, both Garrett and Nico reap the benefits of sticking around at that point, and hopefully they choose to do the same, and you can just kind of be at the point where you're not ever rebuilding. You're just reloading that quarterback position with, you know, talented guys that can play, you know, similar games because you look and they are recruiting similar styles. All of these guys that are going to be on campus this year, all four scholarship quarterbacks can run and pass dual threat guys, whether you're talking GG, Nico, Boyle, or Khalil Wilkins when he gets here in the summer. So hopefully, you know, in the future, you're moving from Garrett to Nico, and then you're letting Sean Boyle and Khalil Wilkins battle it out to see who's the quarterback of the future beyond that. So I think that the quarterback depth, you know, looks light on paper, especially here in the spring, only having three scholarship quarterbacks. But you made it through the entire season last year with only three scholarship quarterbacks, and you're going to be adding a fourth into the mix this year. So I think the quarterback depth is in really good hands because you don't want to have the too heavy to where you're losing guys. You know, you wanted to used to – probably back in the day, keep, you know, five, six guys in that room. But I think the way that they're kind of splitting it up now is a good plan to have. Have about four guys in the room, have them all be separate years of eligibility so that they're not all wanting to transfer out because, you know, they all have the opportunity to eventually, you know, get their shot to be the guy with the way it's set up now currently. So I like the way the quarterback depth not only looks, but also, you know, the style of quarterback that we are recruiting now in the system of offense that we're running with these dual threat quarterbacks, these RPOs. Uh, it's really, you know, beneficial. It worked great last season. I think we're going to really see it be even more fun and explosive uh, this season. Chad Adkins says, can't wait to see the linebackers as a group, especially with a new coach and those injured players back, especially want to see Trotter on the field. Yeah, absolutely. I think Victor Cabral, he's going to be, you know, a really good addition to the staff. I think we're going to see good uh, production out of that, you know, spur position. Now, you know, used to be called the bandit, now known as a spur for this season. You know, the linebackers that we added are really going to help us there. Ty French was a great uh, p player at Gardner Webb. I think he's going to be a great pass rusher. They're probably going to use him almost as a specialist, I think. And of course, Tyron Bradley, we saw flashes last year. You know, you think back to the bowl game, that freaking awesome one handed interception he had against North Carolina. Um, you know, he's got a chance to be a full time player now at that spur position. Him and Ty French, you know, getting good reps there. I think that's going to be fun to see. But you look at the linebacker core, and, you know, it is loaded. Can't wait to see Trotter. Can't wait to see, you know, him and Lathan play together. But then you also have Cutter. And let's not forget another newcomer, Reed Carrico, transferred from Ohio State of all places. So, you know, he was highly talented enough to, you know, get a scholarship offer from, you know, the Buckeyes. So he's a good player in his own. And by all accounts, the reason they left Ohio State because he wasn't a good fit for their system. But he seems tailor-made for the system that we're going to be running this year on defense, this kind of 3-4 
scheme. So I think the linebacker group is something that I'm really excited to see. You know, if you're asking if you're asking me on defense, which position groups I'm watching the most in you know the spring game when I'm there, I'm going to be trying to take notes for you guys and you know see you know what lineups are in first, you know what the sub packages are looking like, things like that as much as I can. But I'm really going to be focusing in on those linebackers and those defensive backs because yes, there's newcomers, but also man, there's a ton of talent and a ton of depth at both those you know positions at both those levels on defense. So I'm excited about that too, Chad. Kenny Evans asks, what do you know about Bronny James? I know he's the son of LeBron James. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Kenny. Um, I think that, um, you know, he's hit the portal. I think that's finally official now. I know it was rumored for a while, but I think he's also putting his name into the draft. So who knows if he's going to go try and, you know, play with his dad in the NBA, try and go ahead and do that. Or if he's just testing to see – what he would look like status-wise if he would be drafted and he's just going to come back and try and transfer somewhere. You know, if he does decide to come back to college, which if I'm guessing, I think that's more likely that he probably does a portal and go somewhere. And, you know, I don't blame him. You know, coaching change. It's not the guy that recruited you anymore. You know, you're afforded that possibility. I think that West Virginia is probably going to, you know, take the, a shot. You know, we know he has a relationship with Rodney Gallagher, but I'm sure everyone in the country is probably going to take a shot. So, uh, We'll see what happens. I don't have any inside info in, on it or anything like that, um, unfortunately, Kenny. But I think that obviously it would be, you know, a player to go after in the portal and someone that West Virginia would contact that they could add to this list of other transfers uh, they've contacted on the basketball side. But it'll be interesting to story to see how it shakes out because I also know that Duquesne just hired um, Drew Joyce, who was a teammate of LeBron James at St. Vincent St. Mary in high school. So that's interesting as well. Could he potentially be, you know, lining it up to go play for, you know, his dad's, you know, one of his dad's best friends, his dad's old teammates as well. That's something to keep an eye on. It'll be interesting to see where he ends up, whether it's going to the draft or hitting the portal. If he does decide to stay in college, hopefully West Virginia gets in the mix. We know that relationship with Rodney Gallagher is definitely there. They played basketball together in AAU and things like that. So, um, you know, West Virginia does have, you know, a potential – I guess, what would you call it, an in with him, a way to, you know, get in contact already. So you never know. Crazier things have happened, Kenny. Crazier things have happened, man. Timmy says, I know it would be a lot to ask, but I would like to see us go 10-2 and two or possibly better. Let's go, Mountaineers. Hey, Tim, I'm not going to, uh, you know, give anything away. We've got the season prediction roundtable coming up in August, um, you know, kind of kick off season seven of the podcast in, in the fall. But, um, you know, looking at the schedule – it is, you know, a tough schedule. There are some teams in the Big 12 that are going to be very good alongside us. I can think of, you know, four or five off the top of my head that I think can contend for a Big 12 title. But we're certainly in that group that will be contending alongside them, I think. And I think this has, you know, the potential to be, you know, a very special season. I've said that, you know, since the offseason began. I'll continue to say that until we get to the season. But I also think this – conference has some really good teams in it so we'll see what happens you know i did a show with wv football going deep on his channel earlier uh this offseason we were talking about it and kind of looking at it like you know eight or nine wins might be the floor for this team they have the potential to be that good i think for me i'm just going to be watching some things here throughout the spring and then of course after that you got to kind of see what the final version of your team your final version of your roster looks like Post spring, because there's always going to be those roster changes that you go through in the summer, whether it's guys moving out or guys moving in. And I think we'll see a little bit of both of that. So, you know, that's obviously subject to, you know, potentially change your opinion. But I think right now, eight, nine, you know, wins is like the floor for me. I think this is a team that certainly can get. Uh, 10 wins and that's what you're hoping for right when you had a nine win season last year you want to see your team continue to improve and I think that you know the defense is what you're hoping takes the next step and your offense if they can just be as good then you really could be cooking with gas I think on offense you're going to be watching just that offensive line you know you return a lot that's it's going to be really experienced you have a chance to have you know four out of five of your offensive line starters be, you know, seniors and, you know, some of those being fifth year seniors. So that's good when you have that type of experience. And also when you're really building it to where you're not rebuilding as Matt Moore said in his press conference yesterday, you're just reloading much like I talked about with the quarterbacks earlier and West Virginia is kind of at the position where they can hopefully continue to do that and just cycle these offensive linemen through and with great depth as well. 
you know, they have nine, ten guys they're going to be able to rely on. But I think you're looking at it just because you lose a guy like Zach Frazier, it's going to be different. you got to hope that the offensive line is just as good. If it is, then I think that this team certainly has a shot at 10-2, and two, Tim. You know, it's not out of the realm of possibility, and I don't think, you know, we're being, you know, um, too optimistic with that. You know, it's not hyperbole. hyperbole. Uh, really, it's a uh, 10-win season possible with this team. Kenny Evans says he hopes they get Rodney the ball more too. I certainly think they will. You know, last season he was still learning the position, didn't really, you know, fully have the grasp of the route tree. I don't think necessarily all the, you know, little intricacies and, and techniques to the wide receiver position, having played, you know, mainly quarterback there in high school. But he's such a good athlete. They found ways to get him the ball, whether it was jet sweeps, reverses, screens, however they could get him involved. And he still made plays when he got the ball into his hands. So I think this year you'll get a good mix of not only getting him involved in some of those plays, you know, like they did last year, but this year you'll get to see him, I think, attack downfield. You know, you'll get to see some pass plays to Rodney Gallagher. There's certainly going to be some things drawn up for him. And you just look at this West Virginia offense and you really start to lick your chops when you think about it, right? Because it's going to be pick your poison for defenses, man. Rodney Gallagher, Traylon Ray, they're talking about him taking a big step. You saw in the practice highlight clips how smooth Huddy Tuddy's looking out there still. I think he's going to have a big year. You got Cole Taylor, who's not even, you know, participating this spring. They're, you know, trying to keep him healthy and ready for the fall. Had, you know, one of the best years of West Virginia tight ends ever had. And we're not even talking about the running game yet, which was the number one in the nation among Power 5 teams, number three in the entire country. You have what I consider the best running back in all of college football and Jaheim White and another running back that's probably what top 10 top 15 and CJ Donaldson and both those guys healthy uh it's going to be scary for uh defenses going up against this West Virginia offense this year guys for sure for sure uh Kenny says what's the depth on tight end uh well that's uh, another good question there uh Kenny because like I said Cole Taylor limited here throughout the spring. So you're going to be seeing a lot, of course, you know, Traylon Davis, we kind of know what we have with him. He's more of the, you know, blocking style of the tight ends. West Virginia can really use him a lot in the run game and, of course, pass protection as well. But they're really looking for another pass-catching tight end to go along with Cole Taylor. And, you know, Will Dixon, he's retro sophomore this year. Uh, he's going to be getting a lot of those looks throughout the spring. It's a big time for him to try and, you know, continue to, um, improve and hopefully prove that he can be that second pass catching tight end because West Virginia is looking to add another one of those to the mix. Not saying that Traylon Davis won't catch passes, but you know he's just not necessarily the strength of his game or something they're going to look for him to do. They're trying to look to have that other you know big tall pass catching tight end alongside Cole Taylor. Uh, so you know in a, alongside Will Dixon, you're going to have Victor Wickstrom still on on campus as well, and then you have two. Uh, Freshman, one being retro freshman Noah Braham, who, you know, is the son of Rich Braham, uh, you know, great offensive lineman at W. And then Jack Samarco, he enrolled early. He's here on campus, you know, 6'6, 242 pound tight end. So great size, you know, as a freshman coming in. It's just going to take some time for him to get acclimated and everything. So I wouldn't expect him to contribute a ton this year. But that's a position that you're looking at West Virginia, maybe when you're talking about still adding pieces after the spring. For the fall, tight end's one that you want to keep an eye on, I would say. Um, not only because Neil Brown mentioned in his press conference, um, April 4th, his April 4th press conference yesterday, um, and was talking about someone stepping up, you know, being another tight end that they can rely on. And if someone does, they might not have to do this, but, you know, they might have to go out and get a tight end. So not only that, but also I reported on it, I think it was about a month ago, West Virginia does have an offer out to an FCS tight end, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think his name's Justin Wolf. If he hasn't committed elsewhere yet, I know they did send one out to him at some point in time. So it seems like tight end's a position. West Virginia could still target maybe in the future, but as far as depth is concerned, you know, that's kind of what you're looking at. But it's going to be the Cole Taylor show, you know, yet again this season. Um, they're trying to keep him healthy. That's why they're limiting him this spring, but he's going to be a huge part of this offense uh, once the fall comes around for sure. Uh, but uh, appreciate you guys, though. I'm going to take one more swig of this water. Uh, if you guys any other uh, questions, comments, drop them in there real quick. Uh, I'll touch on any other ones. If not, uh, we'll get ready to wrap this thing up until uh, next week. We'll be back with uh, Spring Stream 3. Kenny says, I love how you know depth so good. Great job. <laughs> Appreciate that, Kenny, man. It's a, it's a blessing and a, and a curse, you know, to uh, want to know so much about the roster, I guess, right? <laughs> but, no, it's it's fun. I appreciate you guys. 
All right, Debbie football going deep says, shoot, just got here. <laughs> oh, man, hate that, Debbie football going deep. But, hey, that's what the playback's for, right? I feel like I always end up watching people's playbacks more than I get the chance to watch their stuff live. I know schedules are hard to line up a lot. But, hey, man, you've been doing some great content yourself. If, if you guys haven't, uh, be sure, you know, see the name there on the screen, Debbie football going deep. Check them out on YouTube. Ton of great West Virginia football content there as well, just like we have here at the CRW. And I hope you've enjoyed this specific uh, West Virginia football content. We'll have another one next week for uh, Spring Stream 3. Uh, let you know which day exactly that will be on on social media. So be sure to follow us on X slash Twitter at WVU Country Roads and then just Country Roads Webcast on uh, Facebook and Instagram if you want to follow us there. Like I said, if you did get a chance to check this out live or if you watched it on playback, hit the thumbs up button before you head out. Helps a ton with the YouTube algorithm. If you're a WVU fan, be sure to subscribe here for future content, both football and basketball, covering those here on the Country Roads webcast. So be sure to subscribe. If you didn't get a chance to hop in the chat, leave your thoughts in the comments. Appreciate those interactions as well. Looking forward to doing this again next week, guys, with some more WVU football news that comes up here as we continue throughout th spring football practice. And, of course, any WVU basketball news that pops up along the way, report on that as well, whether it be coaching staff or roster news. But it's been a lot of fun. Looking forward to next week and looking forward to talking some more WVU football and continuing to see the new version of this golden blue Mountaineer team in action here as we continue to progress towards the 2024 season. Full steam ahead. Spring game coming up this month, April 27th. We'll get our first look at this team. So excited to uh, get to do that and hopefully get some scrimmages coming up in the near future. And we'll talk about them on Spring Stream 3. So appreciate you guys that tuned in and chimed into this one. As always, I'm Jordan Cruz. And until next time, let's go Mountaineers.